Guten Morgen. Today we are going to talk about diversity for the next 15 minutes in our diversity on stage interview session. I would like to introduce for that my guest, uh, Peter Musafiriadis. Those who speak Urdu, Arabic, or Persian, they know that Musafir means traveler, and he is a polyglot indeed. Let me give a warm welcome to Peter Musafiriadis. Hello, Thank you, Martina. Peter. Thank you very much for that uh, warm welcome. And yes, uh, in over something like 700 languages I've been told, my name means the traveler. So when I go to places like Pakistan, here they say, here he is, Peter the traveler. Peter, let's take a seat over Thank there because much. we do have 15 minutes. I don't want you uh, to stand for that duration. So you just launched the Diversity Atlas and outside we have seen some panels um, as well mentioning the Diversity Atlas. We saw some banners outside in the reception. Tell us more about the Diversity Atlas. What is it exactly? Yes, Diversity Atlas, I suppose, is the culmination of 30 years of work are working in the space of recognizing that cultural diversity can be a, a great driver for building socially cohesive communities, progress and innovation. But what we don't have out there is a tool that actually can measure and provide comprehensive insights, not only into the extent, but the type of cultural and demographic diversity. So what exactly are you hoping to achieve? with the Diversity Atlas? Are you hoping to change society or people's uh, thinking? Well, maybe let me go back one step. Uh, the dialogue of civilizations, at the heart of all civilizations is culture. And at the heart of culture are many, many ethnic groups, many nations, many civilizations out there are nations of nations, yet they haven't come to terms with understanding who they are. And what Diversity Atlas can do is provide those insights, provide that depth, provide that meaningful detail where organisations can then start to develop strategies, implement those strategies, become more inclusive, find ways of how they might be more reflective of their societies. And if they're not, what do they need to do? Because if you can't see yourself in another organisation, then you're going to probably not feel completely valued. 30 years of work. That's uh, quite a long duration. Yes, and it's been in many different manifestations. I initially uh, came to Europe back in 1990 and I trained as a symphonic conductor in Czechoslovakia, Italy, uh, the States for four years. I returned to Australia. I started to work as a conductor, creative director, and I was producing many, many shows, large intercultural productions. And I began to realise that uh, our richness, our collective cultural heritage, we don't take enough advantage of it. And our greatest asset is humanity's cultural diversity. So how should we take more advantage of it? Maybe also in the world of business and uh, organizations and corporations, how should people here actually practically better use cultural diversity? Yeah, so what we try to do with cultural diversity is disaggregated into four main areas. So we look at you know, ethnicity, uh, religion slash worldview. Worldview here we mean uh, uh, finding ways of how we might make sense of all living things around us, whether that may be from a humanistic perspective, atheist perspective, or some of the mainstream religions. Uh, we look at language, and we also look at country of birth as well. As a proxy, for cultural diversity. So when organisations have that information, they can start to look at it and go, wow, we didn't know that in our organisation, in our business, we had 5,000 people who are Muslims. What should we do for them? Maybe we should create, you know, be more culturally responsive and give them floating days. And this is starting to happen. Um, uh, in Australia, organisations are beginning to go, well, you know what, we need to value what we have, but we need to and respect it and provide a forum for those different uh, groups to be able to somewhat assert their identity. And uh, the you know, former president of um, Israel talked about it yesterday. He talked about if you give communities the opportunity to uh, you know, assert their own cultural identity, 
they feel valued, and they will give back more to the community and more to the organization. I'm very interested uh, in learning more about the methodology as well that you're using because we live in an age of uh, data and technology. So which factors, which uh, metrics are you using to come up with this diversity atlas? Okay, so there are three metrics that we look at. We look at variety, balance, uh, and distance or disparity as some sociologists might put it. So in terms of variety, let's say in one group you might have two French and two Italian people and in the other group you might have a French, Italian, Portuguese and Spanish person where you have a greater variety of, let's say, languages. Uh, balance, we mean the distribution of what we're trying to measure, the units. And what we've found in Australia, uh, with a lot of the major studies, 97% of all the key leadership positions in Australia are held by people of Northern European background. And all the main uh, uh, leadership positions in terms of management positions, it's something like 95%. And that's not at all reflective. But those organisations that have greater representation do better. And that's what we mean by balance. And we measure that with the tool. And the other thing we look at also is the distance now, we haven't quite got there yet, and we're getting close to getting it. And what we mean by that is, let's say in this one group you had uh, the French, Italian, Spanish, and um, German, and in another group you had French, Arabic, Japanese, and Swahili, then we know that the distance is going to be much greater in the second group. And there's a great book out there which I recommend that you all read called The Geography of Thought by Nisbet. And he talks about... Uh, someone's ethno-linguistic background influences cognitive processes. And this is something we don't take into consideration. Diversity is obviously something we want to celebrate, be it cultural, uh, gender, um, linguistic, and so on. But with globalization, there is also a risk, and my personal concern, that uh, diversity will die out, that we lose languages with Google Translate and AI and robotics and so on. How to make sure that the world stays as diverse and as a mosaic as it is? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. There are some 7,500 languages that we have in the back-end database of Diversity Atlas. Uh, linguists are telling us that we're going to go to about 2,000 by uh, the year uh, 2,100, and 100 years after that, we may end up with 200. What does that mean about our collective cultural heritage? How would you feel if you were the last speaker of a language? So I also think this is an opportunity to be able to recognise our humanity and being able to support where we can uh, uh, diversity. The same with uh, species, right? In uh, nature as well, uh, we need to make sure that we protect our uh, heritage for sure. Now, in uh, your diversity atlas, you basically have three different categories when it comes to world views. Uh, which are they and why do you limit yourself to three categories when there are so many different worldviews? Every single person, every human being has his or, or her own subjective worldview, isn't it? Okay, so um, it, we, we allow three choices when it comes to religion. So we know that today a lot of people define themselves as, I have friends that define themselves as be, being atheist Muslims or atheist Jews or many people being... Uh, you know, uh, born into uh, a mixed marriage, and they may, you know, subscribe. They might not subscribe philosophically to the worldview, but we know that religion gives expression to our daily existence. So that's why we allow three worldviews. But let's say you, you know, defined yourself as a Muslim, then you would allow, be allowed to put a Sunni, and then you're allowed to go all the way down to, for example, Shafi'i. So we allow up. To, we have sub-branches and sub-groups as well when people select what uh, you know, religion they subscribe to. Religion is a sensitive topic though, um, and how do participants feel in the Diversity Atlas when you surveyed them to talk about yeah. their religious views? Yeah, this question comes up again and again. You know, Europe had two major wars around ethnicity and religion. But my comeback line has is we have a lot more to gain by knowing who the other is. Every setting is intercultural. Every setting is interreligious, but we just never talk about it. 
If we're able to start to have these deep and meaningful conversations, then we build strong bonds. By discovering the other, it reinforces the self. And what also happens is that if there is extremism, it becomes more difficult to uh, divide us. What future trend are you seeing when it comes to diversity? Do you yeah, so to I, I, yeah, I just yes. wanted to mention something else. So in terms of the tool, people can anonymize when they enter their data, or if they want to, if they feel very sensitive about it, they can prefer not to answer the question at all. So which are the big trends when it comes to diversity in the future? Uh, do you see more you know, divergence? Do you see more common traits? Do you see more of an Asian century or, you know, what, what kind of um, big marks are you seeing? What, what well, trends? it's extremely early days for us. And one of the reasons why we're doing this soft global launch is to put the tool out there and see how we can maybe connect with, you know, other nations, other countries that would be interested in uh, partnering with us. But we're noticing some interesting trends, how people value culture in different countries. Uh, we found that we've, we've only developed data in our three countries at the moment, uh, Australia, Pakistan and France, and they all give a different weighting to those pillars of cultural diversity. Uh, in, in Pakistan, religion is placed a lot higher. There's a greater weighting on religion. In France, it's less. In Australia, there's almost an equal distribution in terms of the weighting across those four pillars. And how do you see this change in the future? I still don't know, but what I do know is in some of the interesting things that we've noticed is that organisations that aim to become, uh, to have more cultural diversity in their teams end up having greater gender diversity. So this is still early days for us, and I still think that, you know, we need to have a lot more data before we can start to observe trends and how they may start to inform public policies, social policies, and a whole range of other uh, you know, strategies. And research uh, and facts also prove that if organizations have more cultural diversity, their performance is much higher. Absolutely. And their business is doing much yeah, better. Yeah, McKinsey, Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, all the large consulting firms across the world have got studies that they've done on this that Organisations that have greater cultural diversity, have greater performance, have, and lead to greater innovation. There was a study that just came out a few months ago in Germany, and it found that boards that had at least 20% diversity ended up leading uh, to innovative products which gave them a competitive edge. So it's a no-brainer. The challenge is that you have to manage diversity, and some you know, organisations are lazy, they don't want to make the effort. So we say that diversity can inherently be not a good thing, but if you take advantage of it, it can be an incredible driver for, you know, building peace, giving you the competitive edge, and so many other things. So what is maybe a piece of advice for people here in terms of how they should manage their multicultural and diverse teams? So, uh, How should they manage the diverse teams? How should they make sure that diversity you know, gets acknowledged and is celebrated within organizations that can drive their businesses? Well, almost all organizations now are starting to have diversity and inclusion uh, managers and officers, but they still don't know who they are. So this is the tool that's able to provide those detailed insights, those metrics which can start to allow them to forge a, a, a way ahead through a strategy. And then also exchange, right? I mean, if you have um, a branch in China and, um, you know, a corporate headquarters in New York, uh, different countries around the world, really make sure that you send teams to different places, have cultural workshops, language classes, and of, so on. Uh, yeah, it's excellent uh, what you're raising here. So if you're expanding, it's about uh, having uh, teams that are able to go overseas to different parts of the world that can, that can be uh, interculturally competent. So you might not have Japanese people, but it's about training them up. And this brings me to another point, is that, you know, yesterday we talked about 1989 being the year that, uh, of the, you know, uh, the Berlin Wall coming down and the war to end all wars. But that year something else also happened, and we had the advent of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee you know, invented the World Wide Web, and that has transformed the whole globe. That's created what we call this super-diverse age, this hyper-diverse age where time 
space have been compressed where we're beginning to transact information at lightning speed and all of a sudden people are finding themselves forming these clusters all across the world but what's also happened is they haven't developed the competency of being able to communicate with other people so we've had this what you would call this period of massive economic globalization but globalization without values and ethics and the diversity tool helps you to actually understand where you sit within this framework of who we are and who we're transacting with today and communicating with. That data privacy uh, is a big issue as well, obviously, and you handle a lot of uh, data. So how do you basically protect um, the data against cyber attacks and hacking and so on? If anyone says to you that uh, your data can be protected, 100%, there's no such thing. The moment you are on the World Wide Web, people are seeing what you're doing. And we know that through Cambridge Analytica. They collected 5,000 data points on every single person in the States, and they were able to use that to mobilise a whole nation to vote in a certain direction. What I can say to you is we have the latest methods, and we're trying to invent additional methods as well, such as uh, you know, uh, implementing noise in our, um, you know, our back-end software. I don't understand it. That's what the whole coding team does. But we have whatever's the latest uh, uh, protection, we've got it in Diversity Atlas. My last question, and then I would uh, like to open to the floor for two or three uh, questions until we go to the next uh, session. Where do you hope to take the Diversity Atlas? What is your big goal with it? Well, so we're already having conversations with the Department of Social Services in Australia. Uh, there are other agencies such as the Creative Victoria. The Council for Europe is having an initial conversation with us. Uh, we're hoping that large organisations can start to use this tool and begin to understand who they are and help them inform their long-term strategies. Because one of the things the tool can do as well is actually see how diverse or how reflective, representative you, your organisation is of your community. Fantastic. So we have time for two to three questions uh, from the audience. So please, uh, first of all, raise your hand, uh, say your name, uh, where you come from, keep the question short. And uh, there are mics around, so if you have uh, one or two questions for Peter, let us know. Otherwise, he'll be around uh, for the rest of the day, right? Uh, so people can ask you directly. There is uh, somebody, a oh, gentleman here in the front. My name is TKS Ilangovan. I'm, I'm a member of parliament from India. See, cultural infusion has taken, from the very beginning we had seen, when we listen to some of the songs in American movies or the singers, our music directors who make music for films use those tunes. Like when we listen to the song, congratulations and jubilations, the same tune was adapted. And we had a great Carnatic musicians from India playing all over the world and it was well received by the audience like M.S. Subbalakshmi when she went to a U.S. or a, a, a France or a Canada or Britain she was received well. So this kind of exchange of programs will definitely help cultural infusion because when we listen some song in the radio we take up the tune and convert it to a, in our language and we do it. So, but well, thank you, DK. So I wasn't quite hearing the question, but what I can say uh, as an add-on to that is that the lifeblood of culture is confluence. It always has been. You know, and if you look at history, you know, it's moments when civilizations have come together to exchange ideas which has led to the betterment of humankind. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Otherwise, we move on to the uh, next session. Thank you so much, Peter, for your great insight Thank and you, good Martina. luck with the Diversity Atlas. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.